this week's drive, we get taken out from behind, fall down from on high, kick up some dust, and blow start an unusual new car. All this and more in this week's Drive. Time is ticking away for Formula One world champions Michael Schumacher and Ferrari. Ahead of the Italian Grand Prix at Monza, the team's drivers ran an obstacle race with a difference. Schumacher and teammate Rubens Barrichello took part in basketball, golf and mountain bike challenges on the streets of Milan. At the wheel, Schumacher has tended to get the better of Barrichello over the course of his career. And this time, though, the seven times world champion had to settle for second best to his Brazilian rival, Barrichello proving highly adept at each of the three disciplines. It has been many great moments I have been able to live in, in the ten years I'm roughly together with Ferrari. The four wins in Monza, the wins in Imola, the wins in all around the world. They have been very special, the championships. We're suffering all together at the moment a little bit, but I mean, you can't, can't always uh, have the good life. You sometimes have to suffer to see how good the life has been and m might be again. The team won their home race for the past three years, but this year the pair finished only 10th and 12th. Ferrari has struggled all season to match the pace of Renault and McLaren. Ferrari's sudden loss of form has fueled speculation that Schumacher might retire soon. Barrichello has already announced that he will drive for BAR next year. Seven times champion Schumacher failed to finish at the previous round in Turkey while Rubens was 10th. There was promise at the earlier Hungarian Grand Prix where Michael started on pole and finished second. I mean, uh, after Budapest, there was obviously a great hope that we will do it. After Turkey, the hope has shrinked a lot. <laughs> so we have to see one uh, and have to be realistic. It's, it's all with, within our work, whether we can be successful on that or not. But apart from taking part in embarrassing public displays, what do Formula One drivers do outside of racing and testing? Jano Trulli retreats to his vineyard near his birthplace of Pescara in Italy. Jano has helped Toyota to new heights in Formula One this season, claiming the team's first podium finish as well as their maiden pole position. But after a strong start, Toyota has fallen off the pace of Renault and McLaren, with BAR Honda also claiming the upper hand. And Jano hasn't been on the podium since the Spanish Grand Prix in May. Already this year we've been several times on the podium, which is not too bad. But um, it's not finished. We need, um, we need to get some more uh, speed out of the car. And the, the team has to get some more experience. And um, all these things will make the team stronger. And uh, for sure we have to work on the car to make it quicker. So. Uh, it might take one year, two or three years, but I really believe we will, um, we will make it because the team has got the potential to, to do it. 2005 has already been a vintage year for Jano and Toyota, and there's no reason to suppose that he won't be toasting more success soon. The Indy Racing League's first ever road course event got off to a clean start at Sonoma in California. Australian Ryan Briscoe led the field from his maiden pole position, but on the first lap, Sam Hornish spun in turn seven. On the second lap, he stopped on the track with gearbox failure. On the 19th lap, the two fastest qualifiers, Briscoe and Helio Castroneves, crashed while attempting to pass rookie Danica Patrick. Briscoe slammed into the side of Patrick and she gathered up Castroneves. Briscoe tried to pass on the inside in the turn, got into the dirt and was not able to apply the brakes. Briscoe later called it a pretty big mess. To be so anxious to, to you know, to crash someone out and make a desperate move um, 15 laps into an 80 lap race, it's not very smart. Dan Weldon then broke a fuel pump on the 53rd lap. That allowed Tony Kanaan to take the lead when the green flag was waved on lap 56. There was contact between Thomas Schechter and Jeff Bucknam, and Schechter retired with a damaged steering arm. Kanaan was able to hold on to the top spot for the remaining laps, averaging 91 miles an hour to claim his second race victory of the season 
and the sixth win of his IndyCar Series career. Canaan won by 1.18 seconds, or about eight car lengths over Buddy Rice, who claimed his best finish of the year. Alex Baron was third. In victory lane, Canaan did several push-ups near his car. The stock cars of NASCAR moved to the half-mile track in Bristol, and the race start was moved forward with the threat of rain. With Matt Kenseth leading all the way, on lap 76, Casey Mears slowed to avoid a crash up ahead, only to plow into Hermie Sadler. Then, on the 93rd lap, Casey Kane was tapped from behind by Kevin Harvick. Kane spun and banged into the wall. With Jeff Gordon leading, Earnhardt also sustained damage after he spun into the wall. On lap 210, Rusty Wallace and Dale Jarrett collided, and as Jarrett spun, Carl Edwards plowed into him. Wallace, retiring at the end of the season, has won at Bristol nine times, but not this time. A little more than halfway through the race, on lap 256, Stanton Barrett spun and hit the outside wall hard. Smoke billowed out of Barrett's car, a sure sign that the engine has expired. Under the yellow flag, the leaders pitted, and Bobby Labonte took the lead. About 110 laps later. On lap 318, Dale Jarrett tapped Ryan Newman and turned him around. Kevin Harvick apparently didn't see Newman and drove directly into him. Jarrett was slapped with a two-lap penalty for rough driving. Jamie McMurray, Mike Bliss and Dale Earnhardt were also involved in the crash. This was the view from Harvick's in-car camera. His crew directed him to go to the inside, but he was unsighted and had no chance of avoiding the stationary Newman. Kyle Petty spun with seven laps to go, bringing out a final yellow flag. The green flag flew with just two laps to go, setting up a sprint to the finish, won by Matt Kenseth. It was the first race victory for Kenseth in nearly 18 months and moves him to 11th in the overall standings. He faces a battle if he's to race for the championship. Only the top 10 drivers can do so, and Kenseth is just 11 points behind the 10th place car with only two races remaining. streets of Montreal hosted the Champ Cars. It was a fairly uneventful race with no major incidents in the early stages. On one of his pit stops, Canadian native Paul Tracy locked up the brakes and slid into the pit wall, collecting a crew member along the way and making it impossible to change the left wheels. The crewman wasn't injured. Timo Glock, whose best previous finish in nine races this season was sixth, was on an out-of-sequence pit strategy that put him into the lead late in the 79-lap race. He made his last stop on lap 56 and fell to 11th, but found himself out front when all the other drivers ahead of him pitted under caution on lap 60. As he tried desperately to hold on to the top spot, Timo twice blocked Oriel Sevilla's Newman Haas Lola, nearly forcing Sevilla into a concrete wall as the two came close to bumping wheels. Sevilla races for the team half-owned by actor Paul Newman. The German was ordered to give the top spot to Sevilla, pulling over just long enough to let him pass on the final lap of the 2.7-mile, 15-turn road circuit. Once in the lead, Sevilla beat Glock to the finish line by exactly one second to earn his first win in 95 Champ Car races. So, I'm really happy, really glad. Really, really glad. They've been so close, so many times, so, so many times. And it's just finally, now, now many more to come. <laughs> Sevilla demoted former series champion Paul Tracy into third place in the title chase. Cows on the Isle of Wight of England's south coast hosted the British Grand Prix, fourth leg of the Powerboat P1 World Championship. There were 12 teams competing in two race classes, Evolution and Supersport. In the first race, Evolution Championship leaders Sony moved into an early lead. In the Supersport class, it was the championship leaders Buzzy Bullet who hit the front first in their home waters, but Jolly Drive overhauled them. In the Evolution class, it was the Sony team who crossed the finish line first, but their celebrations were short-lived as they were later disqualified for missing a boy. So, first place went to OSG Donzi, with the new Faneplast boat taking second. 
Taking a well-deserved checkered flag in the Supersport class was an understandably elated Jolly Drive team, while home favourite Buzzy Bullet came in a close second. The second day of competition saw big crowds and perfect weather for the weekend's final round of racing. Both the Evolution and Supersport class boats got underway as they headed out on a 51 nautical mile round the island endurance race. Once again, the Italian team Sony used their superior power to hit the front. Not too far behind were the previous day's victors, OSG Donzi. In the Supersport class, Buzzy Bullet's knowledge of the local waters helped them into a tight lead over their championship rivals, Jolly Drive, who were following closely in second. But disaster struck the British team as Buzzy Bullet stopped with engine problems, allowing Jolly Drive to move into the lead. In the Evolution class, it was the Sony team who claimed the honours, with Vetpunk.com taking second. OSG Donzi finished third to claim the overall victory. In the Supersport class, Jolly Drive took the chequered flag and maximum points for the weekend. I'm very happy because for us, it's almost more important to win in England than it is to win the World Championship, as Sony are dominating. They have a great boat and the boys are fantastic. Jolly Drive took the overall honours in the Supersport class. They're second in the standings with 44 points, 13 points behind Buzzy Bullet. NASA Sali Alatia from Qatar and Britain's Chris Patterson began the Syrian rally strongly, setting the fastest time in the opening 1.8-kilometer super special stage outside of Damascus. They built on that lead through the next eight timed stages and led by 57 seconds entering the last day. Alatia stretched his advantage over Sheikh Khalid al Qasimi to 2 minutes and 25 seconds after 13 timed stages in the hills north of Damascus. But Alatia had been fortunate. Al Qasimi incurred two minutes of road penalties changing a rear suspension arm and was unable to benefit from beating Al Atiyah by around 40 seconds in the 11th stage when the Qatari sustained two punctures. The pair exchanged times over the subsequent stages as Al Qasimi refused to relinquish his title without a fight. The UAE driver won the 14th and 15th stages, but the Qatari redressed the balance on stage 16 to lead by 1 minute and 55 seconds and eventually emerged victorious with a winning margin of 1 minute and 59 seconds to record his first Syrian rally victory and his sixth consecutive triumph in the Middle East Rally Championship this year. Former regional Group N champion Sheikh Abdallah Al Qasimi made some differential setting changes on the final day. He began 41 seconds ahead of Jordan's Amjad Farah and quickly extended his advantage as Farah suffered centre diff problems and struggled to cut into the UAE driver's lead. Syria's Haytham al Yusufi and his Qatari co driver Adel Hussein had been running as high as third overall during the opening leg, but they were later penalised for a pair of jump starts and handed a 10 minute penalty for a route infringement. The Syrian duly dropped out of the top 10 and decided against restarting the second leg on Friday. Syria's Mirar Al Humsi finished in fifth position with Lebanese co driver Ziad Jahab and the UAE's Sadiq Fadel completing the top six in his Mitsubishi. Jordan's Faris Bustami finished seventh overall. Eventually, Sali Alatia clinched his second Middle East Rally Championship in three years by winning the sixth Syrian International Rally, round six of the regional series. He completed the 17 stages two minutes ahead of defending champion Khaled Al Qasimi of the UAE. With two rallies remaining, he has an unassailable lead in the standings, 22 points clear of Al Qasimi in second. Compatriot Sheikh Suhail bin Khalifa Al Maktoum lies third with 28 points. His success also moved Japanese manufacturer Subaru 12 points clear of arch-rival Mitsubishi in the Manufacturers' Championship. Round 7 of the regional series will be the Nicosia-based Trudos Rally in Cyprus in October. World Superbike Championship leader Troy Corsa was fastest out of the blocks in race 1 at the legendary Assen circuit, 
and was soon leading Noriyuki Haga, Christopher Mullen and Andrew Pitt. The race quickly became a three-way battle between pole setter Vermeulen, defending champion James Toesland of Britain, and Japan's Haga, before Vermeulen edged into the lead and took flight. It was a lot less comfortable for Ducati Xerox rider and defending champion Toesland, however, who had to fight off the attentions of Haga before securing second place. Haga reversed the grid position with championship leader Corsa as the Australian looked content to protect his series lead with a fourth place finish. In race two, Haga led from the start ahead of Pitt and Corsa, but it was Toesland and Vermeulen making the moves up the pack and into the leading group. The lead changed hands several times before Toesland pulled a great passing move on Haga for the lead but then a missed gear shift let Hager and Vermeulen get through and clear. Hager looked to have made a decisive move with four laps remaining after setting the fastest lap of the race, but Vermeulen then snatched the lead on the penultimate lap and held on by just a single bike length at the finish. Vermeulen needed to win to stay in championship contention with fellow Australian Troy Corsa, who settled for points in both races. Corsa eventually wore down yet another Australian, Andrew Pitt, and was able to take fourth place. Corsa leads the title chase ahead of Vermeulen. With three races remaining, the World Superbike Paddock now travels to Lausitz in Germany. Nicknamed the Sand Pit, the Dutch Leerop course is notoriously technical, but multiple world champion Stefan Everts soon mastered it. In the first race, he powered into an early lead ahead of fellow Belgian Steve Ramon, who had his own battle with Brian Jorgensen of Denmark. Frenchman Michael Pichon suffered a nasty crash, but was able to recover enough to take part in race two. Joshua Coppins got the better of Jussi Vevelainen after a long tussle for third place. The Finn would eventually finish sixth. The other New Zealander on a charge was Ben Townley, lying third in the championship behind his countryman Coppins, and he finished fourth. Everts took a full 25 points for the win, just a sniff away from his ninth world title. Race two saw a closer fought battle for the lead. Everts was going to have to fight for this one. This time it was Ben Townley who laid down the challenge to the Belgian. For a while the two were neck and neck until the experience of Everts came to the fore and it began to count. Fellow Belgian Steve Ramon was again putting on a good race and had secured third place ahead of Joshua Coppens. In the end, the championship leader romped home comfortably ahead of Townley to extend his championship lead by another 12 points over nearest rival Coppins for the margin of 57 points. With only 50 points on offer with one event remaining, that handed the championship crown back to the Belgian. With a record 86 Grand Prix wins and nine world titles, retirement has been mentioned, but Everts is already testing his Yamaha for next year. The last race of the season is in Ireland, where the minor positions will be decided. Volvo's newest concept car is actually a safety experiment on wheels aimed at young drivers. To be able to start this car, the driver must first blow into an Alco lock. If he or she fails the breathalyzer test or fails to put on the safety belt, the car won't start. And the car knows who's driving and accommodates their level of skill by restricting speed. It's about sober driving, it's about speed limiting, and it's about seatbelt usage. And this vehicle has uh, an, ingre an ingredient for all of these three variants. So there is a feature for using the seatbelt, there is a feature for driving soberly, and there is a feature for limiting the speed. This car also has different keys. With a red key, the car knows that there's an inexperienced driver at the wheel, and it won't go faster than 60 kilometers an hour. There are several occasions when it could be good, uh, useful to limit the maximum speed of the vehicle. 
One example is for young people who recently have taken uh, passed the driver license. There are, they can think of other cases for professional drivers, for example, or you can think of other cases as well. So there is a, we think there's a market for, for having one normal key for a vehicle, and then you have the other key where you have a limited maximum speed. So what does Marcus, who's 22 and a relatively new car driver, think about Volvo's speed key? Well, I do find the speed restriction in the car to 60 kilometers an hour quite annoying. But I think the fact that the car is equipped with the Alcolock system is really good. His mother, Vicky, who's also tested the car, doesn't share his opinion. I think it's a really good idea. And I would consider buying this car with the Alcolock and speed limitations. However, I'm not so sure my 20-year-old son would appreciate as much. Some European countries already have a young person's driver's license, which prohibits drivers from going over 90 kilometers an hour for a certain period. A speed key would be an ideal solution in this case. Volvo calls this system, with its various keys, multi-lock. But the technology is not designed just for young drivers. It's equally suitable for commercial traffic. For example, a delivery vehicle that never leaves the city center and doesn't need to travel more than 70 kilometers an hour. The speed key can be pre-programmed to any speed. Volvo has developed this special vehicle to gauge interest in traffic safety, both from the general public and the decision makers. International statistics show that the risk of 18 to 25 year olds being involved in a collision was more than twice that of people aged 26 to 50. I think there is definitely a market for this feature. You can, uh, you can easily think of parents, professionals in, in several cases where this could be a good feature. Volvo says that it's perfectly possible for multi-lock technology to go into production within the next two years. Ethanol, the clean burning fuel made from corn and other biomass sources, which has been touted for years as the renewable resource that could replace oil, is finding new acceptance as petrol prices continue to rise. In fact, though still rare, the number of service stations offering ethanol has jumped by 60% in America since the beginning of the year. There are over 4 million vehicles on the road with engines that can run on ethanol as well as petrol. A flexible fuel vehicle is a vehicle that can run on pure gasoline. It can run on 10% ethanol and 90% gas, all the way up to 85% ethanol and 15% gasoline. This is very important because with the E85 flex fuel vehicles that we have today in the marketplace, we can get them all running on E85. We can significantly reduce our dependence on foreign oil. Today, a US gallon or 3.8 liters of E85 sells for 20% less than regular petrol. And in ease of use at the pump and performance on the street, there's little difference. Rick Hittel recently installed two E85 pumps at his service station in Arizona. We've had a great response to E85 because people really like the fact that it displaces crude oil. You know, an 85% is a direct displacement of a renewable fuel. Uh, it's a, such high oxygen content, it burns so thoroughly that it's a, it's a very low emission product. And, and those are, are very important to people. General Motors, which produces over a million pickup trucks a year with flexible fuel engines, says as much as 30% of American petrol consumption could be replaced by ethanol if it were reliably available across the country. So, whether you're enjoying a quiet drink with friends, messing about in boats, or just getting on your bike, so you stay on track and up to speed, make sure you catch next week's Drive.